Hi, this is Laura Lee Griffin. And this is Nikki May with the Stardust Society, inspiring you to stop getting in your own way and start building an art biz and life that you love. We are artists who believe strongly in the power of community, accountability, following your intuition, taking small, actionable steps, and breaking down the barriers of fear and procrastination that keep you stuck. Follow along with us on our creative business journey as we encourage you on yours. Dave Conry is an artist and designer from Southern California, currently working towards building a client-free creative business model. When he isn't working on his own creative projects, he spends his time exploring new resources for creating and selling art, and then shares what he learns with his fellow designers and artists. He also makes cool things so others can go make their things and put more cash in their pockets. I've been following Dave for a long time, and the number of things that he does makes my head spin. (laughs) He paints, he designs posters, t-shirts, typefaces, magazines, he blogs, makes YouTube videos, now he's even exploring NFTs, and about a zillion other things. There are so many things that we could talk about with Dave that we could record for hours and hours, but today we want to introduce you to him and focus on print on demand and creating art and design challenges. Dave, welcome to the Stardust Society. Yeah, thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Thanks for being here. So we like to start off our interviews, Dave, with asking our guests about their Stardust story. So what has led you to become this amazing creator and designer that you are today? So it's a pretty long journey. I mean, you know, uh, a lot of gray hairs have uh, have come (laughs) and gone. But, um, you know, I've been doing design work since the late nineties was when I graduated design school and mm-hmm. I, I started working with some small boutique firms and then um, 9-11 happened and it kind of just crushed everything. I was working solo freelance for a long time until I ended up getting a job working as an art director for a fairly large magazine publishing company. And that was basically, uh, I would bounce around from magazine to magazine, you know, just doing whatever work needed to be done for a while until Mm -hmm. I finally landed on a couple that I could stay with for years. But the thing about magazine uh, art directions is it's not as beautiful uh, all the time. I mean, it's really, it was a fun job and I can't complain about it, but the creative aspects of the job were fewer and further between than you might expect. And so Mm -hmm. I... I felt like at a certain point while I was working on these magazines, just pushing out pages every single day that I was like losing my creative touch. Mm -hmm. And so I decided to start dabbling outside, you know, my own, just like, you know, starting to do uh, some abstract canvases just, just to get some sort of creative flow. And, you know, one thing led to another and I ended up doing a lot more of that. Then I started, you know, creating like, you know, like some physical collages and then some digital collages and started selling on Etsy and started, you know, printing out stuff and going to like different fairs and and whatever to, you know, sell it. And, you know, and then I started, you know, blogging at kind of in the same time, I was just kind of blogging about my experience, but also Mm -hmm. interjecting some of my knowledge of being in, uh, in the design world, in the advertising world, and just in marketing in general, what I've learned. And I started just building up a little bit of a following in different places because of that. I started a podcast, not not much different than what you guys have got going on, talking to people about kind of a similar subject matter. Right. And mm-hmm. it just kind of like, it just kind of snowballed. And what I found out about myself is that I really enjoyed helping other people. Like it, I yeah. really got juice from, you know, like whenever somebody would take something I did and turn that into something, whether it's actually just to go make something or to actually start their, their business journey or to at least get past a particular hurdle that they may have gotten through, you know, or getting gotten stuck on in the past. And so that was going pretty well for a while. And then I don't remember the years, like I think it was 2013. Mm-hmm. I, I'll never forget this. It was shortly after, I don't know, I guess it was probably around February of 2013. And one day I just sat down at my desk and I was just kind of fed up with doing the work in general. I wasn't having a good time. I wasn't really enjoying my coworkers in this one particular magazine that I was working on. We weren't getting along well. And I sat down at my desk when I first walked in the door and I sat down and I said, I just don't want to be here. And mm-hmm. I opened up my email and there's two emails in there. And one of them is from the VP of 
pretty much everything in the company <laughs> saying you have an emergency meeting. Wait, with- I want that job title. VP <laughs> right. of pretty much everything. Yeah. And it was like, I was like, I'd never met this guy before in my life. I knew his name, but I'd never met this guy. He didn't work in our building. He worked in like a different state. And I was like, okay, that's weird. But the thing was, is the meeting was at like 830 and here it was 915. I was like, <laughs> I, I mean, I don't check my emails, you know, from home. I wasn't checking emails from home because I was right. one of those guys. I've like shucked all that work that stays at the office when I leave. Right. And I was like, uh, and then the second email was like, uh, we have a, another emergency meeting of the entire motorcycle group, which is what the, which I was working. I was working on a motorcycle magazine at the time. So the entire motorcycle group of our company was all getting together for an emergency meeting. And I was like, what is going on? And then nobody was there. Like nobody, I couldn't see anybody, couldn't find anybody Uh. until I saw (laughs) one of my other art director coworkers come around the corner just with this sullen look on his face and and a big manila envelope in his Mm -hmm. hand. We know what that Mm -hmm. means. Right. Yeah. And it was just like, oh my gosh, (laughs) what's going on? (laughs) Really? Oh my gosh. And then when it finally started to sink in, it was like, yes, this is really happening. (laughs) This is really happening. Like, did I just manifest this? Did I, like, literally, before I even sat down, I sat down like, in the computer and, and before I even turned it on, did I just manifest my own um, pink slip? You know? And I was like, everybody else was, was like so upset and everything. And I was just, I mean, I was still a little sh- in shock about it, but I was like, right. I was actually a little excited. I was like, but I didn't know what to do because the meeting that I was supposed to be at, it already happened. I went upstairs to go see him to see that guy, but he wasn't there, you know, mm. VP of everything. You know, he wasn't there in his <laughs> office at the time. So he must have been. Where's my severance package? <laughs> right. Yeah. So I was like, whatever. So, so then I went to this meeting and they basically told us that they had sold off the entire, like our company had sold off the entire motorcycle group to another company and that they were basically only taking the editors. And, um, oh, the salespeople for the magazine, yeah. like the people that get generated income and the people that generated content. And as an art director, I wasn't generating content. Anybody could really do my job. And I ended up like, I, I mean, I just was like, well, it's just so surreal. Eventually, I, you know, obviously had a conversation with HR and that guy came in and, and, you know, VP of everything came in and <laughs> gave me this severance check. And, and I immediately went, I was like, this is so weird. Right. And so my buddy who was carpooling with me, I drove. My buddy was carpooling with me. I said, dude, you're going to find a ride home. <laughs> I'm, out here. I'm out. Right? I'm out. <laughs> Peace. <laughs> so, and then I had my laptop with me because I always took it with me wherever I went. And I drove to the nearest Starbucks, like not a quarter of a mile from where I was. I mm-hmm. sat down and I wrote down a blog post about um, the color of the day is pink. <laughs> and it just essentially just sent myself on that. Oh, and I, you know, I'm going to backtrack just a little bit. Like in February, before this happened, I had written an article that basically said that I considered myself unemployable, meaning mm-hmm. that even though I am employed, I no longer feel like I could ever work for anybody else but myself. I know that feeling well. Yeah. right. So the, yeah. here it is, May. I think it was, it was actually May when the layoffs happened. So it was several months later Then I sat down and did that thing. And I was just like, oh my gosh. Right. So here we are. We're on this journey. Okay. I've got a big fat fed severance check because I've been with the company for 10 years. Let's go do something. And that's kind of awesome. <laughs> that's just, yeah. That's kind of like, yeah, that was a long winded approach, but it's, I always found it to be a good story. So what did you do next? I mean, everything. Yes, and you're still and you're still right. doing everything. Yeah, no, I mean, you know, I was still I was still blogging at the time. I was trying to sell some art prints here and there, but what I, I told myself at the time is that I was in the blog. There was a series of blog posts that got a whole lot of attention, and it was essentially, mm-hmm. you know, one of these listicles of like five different places you can sell your art. It was like five different days of five different places you could sell your art, mm-hmm. and so I took all of those posts and I just expanded on them. And went in detail. And I wrote mm-hmm. this book. I self-published my own book called Selling Art Online. Mm-hmm. And it's yep. still out there, but it's totally, I mean, all the all the information is basically antiquated by this time. But what year was this? This was 2013. Okay. okay. So the, the landscape has changed dramatically. Right. And I probably right. could go back and write it again, but I really don't have the impulse to do that. But I should. I should, but I probably won't. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> so I wrote that book. And then that mixed with the the podcast and all it mean, just kind of like 
just kind of like pushed me in this direction to just really like not only to help myself, but also to, you know, like help other people do their thing. And that that went like that for quite a few years until that got to a certain point where I was going to start another book about, you know, the practical applications of selling your art in a new digital world. And I started to write that book, but I thought to myself, you know, I need to be selling more art. Like I need mm-hmm. to actually be doing more of this because it really mm-hmm. I was getting most of my money from like affiliate income and, and uh, you know, like uh, some of these book sales and whatever, because I'd written a couple of books by that time. And I was like, you know what, I need to make more art and start mm-hmm. selling more art. And then I can say, okay, this is the steps that I'm taking and yep. you can see my entire journey. And I started doing that. And I was like, you know what, I'm really enjoying making the art again. And then that was just like, so like, I really got into that and I started documenting more of that. And the, the podcast kind of fell aside because I was no longer as interested in talking with other people, which is what I was doing on the show. I was more interested in just kind of, you know, documenting my own journey. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, you know, that's that's the way it's been ever since. You know, And just, what kind of art were you making at that time? At the time, it was very, it was, it, there was still a lot of digital collage, mm-hmm. but it was more like... It was a little different than what I do now, where it was like I would kind of just like take pictures of things and then cut them out and then collage them together onto right. a, you know, a Photoshop canvas. And now it's like I just kind of like pull stuff from everywhere. Like I, I still take pictures or whatever, but this would be, you know, be like I'll pull things from everything. So I'll, I'll destroy things and I'll put them back together. I'll tear them apart or whatever. And it's not much different, but it's a little bit more. I guess I would just say that I'm better at it now than yeah. I was before. Yeah. Yeah. You know. So I've mentioned, uh, I listed a few of the things you do, and I know that there's even more that I didn't even mention. Like, um, I guess it was last year sometime you did this whole series of painting on spray paint cans, which was awesome. And I don't have them uh, readily available, but I'll show you (laughs) one right now. But so we always hear that it's important to niche down and focus in on one or just a few specific things, but you seem to just go all in on something new all the time, which I think is fantastic. Mm -hmm. And then you share and teach about what you just learned. So, I mean, what's your process or how do you decide what to focus on next? Or do you just kind of follow whatever you're curious about? I, it is. Okay. So here's the thing that once I realized what my true calling was, uh-huh. Mm-hmm. It's not to necessarily to make art. I, I mean, I feel like I'm pretty good at making art. You know, I, I, you I'm, are. I'm not going to be hung in, in Tate Modern anytime soon, but I do feel like I, I'm, I've progressed pretty good with mm-hmm. my work, but that's not my truest calling. You know, it's like I'm yeah. called to it because I, I, I can't not create. I'm right? always doodling, making, yes. doing something. I'm always, yes. I got my iPad near me all the time. Even on my iPhone, I've got the Procreate po- pocket app and just like even if like if i get too fidgety i'll break that out and just like start messing around with it even though it's like really difficult it's super challenging to do that but you know if i got to i've got to draw with your fingers (laughs) yeah pretty much yeah yeah but my real calling is the is the helping of others people right that's really my thing and so the way i look at this is that it doesn't matter what all these other things i do right if i want to talk about how to make digital posters one day turn around how to do things in alternative uh, apps like the affinity suite versus Adobe suite Mm -hmm. or paint on cans or, you know, how to, you know, whatever it all kind of comes full circle because I uh, ultimately I'm just trying to say, listen, you know, this is all exploration and we're all trying to, you know, I'm just trying to figure out out all this stuff so that I can share what information I can with other people. But I also see that when I do jump into these other areas, I do jump into different mediums one of my biggest goals was like trying to find the juxtaposition or the the crossroads rather of my design skill and mm-hmm. my art skill right because mm-hmm. 10 years ago if you looked at those things they would be completely disparate they they wouldn't even be connected at all right but now as i've gone they just kind of bring themselves closer and closer and closer together and i think that everything that i work on whether I pursue it for a long period or even a, very, a short period, all of those things are just helping me become a better artist in general. And they're all working towards the main goal. Yeah. And I can totally see that in your work. You definitely have, and I have that exact same thing. I'm both an artist and a designer and I, I've done the same thing. My two separate things have merged into one 
whether I want them to or not. So I can definitely <laughs> I can definitely see that in your work as well. Yeah. Yeah. The whether I want to or not is sometimes that's a little bit of a struggle sometimes, too. It's like, yeah. Ah. Do you find <laughs> like I do that um, that sometimes I want to be looser and let the art side come out. But the designer who wants everything to be perfect kind of uh, keeps that from happening. Yeah, especially in the design side, for sure, you know, because, you know, I, I, you know, magazine design is very, you know, I wasn't allowed to be David Carson, right? You know, right. And for anybody who's unfamiliar, David Carson was a a designer, still a designer, but he was he was kind of an up and coming designer in the late 80s, early 90s, and really is responsible for kind of opening everybody's eyes to some pretty radical design alternatives in in magazine publishing and every designer every magazine designer back then probably had some aspirations to a certain degree to be that kind of expressive so everybody wanted in fact i'm looking over here i've got uh end of print which is his first book just sitting right here just conveniently sitting right next to me right (laughs) but um you know like everybody wanted that but it was like unrealistic that that was going to happen for 99 the editors and publishers didn't want that yeah, well, I mean, his he purposely, you know, would legitimately go out of his way to make things illegible on <laughs> because he right. was more interested in how it looked on the page rather than yeah. whether yeah. it read well or not. But um it, there is that that learned behavior that we have with the design side, the grid-based design, mm-hmm. everything, you know, boxed in with everything. And so there's oftentimes I would just be I'll be designing something and I'll just completely shut off the it's it's all analytical it's almost like it's left brain design Mm -hmm. right like the right brain stuff just disappears and and then i'll look at it and like from a design standpoint it's aesthetically okay right but it doesn't feel like me and so i'll have to go back in and just like you know throw spray paint on it somehow you know like you know (laughs) cut something up and just destroy it you know even i'm doing a you know, here's a plug. I'm doing a, a course right now on how to build handwritten fonts. And, yeah. you know, because this wasn't something easy for people to do in the past, but it's actually a lot easier now. So I'm doing a course on this. I'll take that course. Yeah. It's coming soon. Very, very soon. Um, so if I'm creating bumpers that go in videos, you know, between the cutscenes or PDFs that are like of downloads, you know, downloadable stuff that people have to go with the course, like I catch myself you know, like just designing regular designer stuff and then like have to go back and like, okay, that's not what this should look like, you know, because it's like, you know, when you see my video, I'm a little bit chaotic in, 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 in a good way, right? I'm trying to be fun. I'm trying to be entertaining, mm-hmm. trying to be a little bit fast paced. And, you know, like I want that same energy in the stuff that I'm putting out. Right. And it should mm-hmm. reflect everything, everything about my personality, everything about my artistic skill should come through in everything that I'm putting through. And so I have to check myself often, even just on those little things. Well, yeah. I love I love your um, your idea of wanting to build a, a client free creative business, oh, yeah. because <laughs> I mean, you don't have clients telling you to stay in that box. So <laughs> you have all the freedom in the world to break out of it. Yeah. You know, and that's it's just been one of the, it's one of these things where you like self realization Right. Self-awareness is is such a big, big, big part of how I've become what I've become. Mm-hmm, and not mm-hmm. that I've become anything super fancy, but it just makes me I'm more fulfilled now as an artist and designer because of that self-awareness and understanding that I'm just I don't know if I have the gene inside me that says it's OK to say yes to a client. Right. It's or, or it's OK to accept a client's input. Right. Or to not be combative <laughs> when they do <laughs> put their input in. Right. It, and, you know, it just never gave me joy. And there were plenty of clients who were good clients. Yeah. Plenty of clients who were good clients, paid well, you know, but the work didn't give me joy. I never felt like I was really that into it. And I never felt like anybody wanted design from me the way I wanted to design. I always felt like I was hedging a little bit to compensate right they appreciated my level of skill they didn't necessarily want what i was designing and so they didn't want what made you unique in your design exactly yeah yeah okay so the pink slip happened and Mm -hmm. it ended up being like 
um, a positive thing in disguise, right? Mm -hmm. And you started on your own and you realized, I love helping people. That's where I get my juice. So how, after leaving sort of a steady paycheck, how have you diversified your income today so that you can support this thing where you don't have to have clients that you get to do all the artwork and the design work that you love? A lot of fingers in a lot of pies, right? I mean, a lot of fingers in a lot of pies, a lot of very small pies, you know, like, and so like the books, the books still sell, even though they don't sell as well as they used to, the books still sell. I've designed, I've done, I've experimented with pretty much every type of print on demand. We've talked, we'll talk about this, I'm sure, but Mm -hmm. every type of print on demand, whether it's going through, uh, like doing a print on demand directly to an Etsy shop or to something like Redbubble or, Mm -hmm. uh, uh, T Spring or T Public or whatever, uh, Amazon's KDP. I, I mean, I have all of these different things in those ways, just generating small bits of income here and there. Right. Uh, I'm also I'm on YouTube and I earn income from YouTube. You know, I I've had uh, some sponsorships, not a lot, but I've had sponsorships from that. I have a Patreon account that mm-hmm. is kind of started because I was doing the YouTube thing, but really is kind of like all encompassing of everything. And uh, and now I just. I mean, on top of that, I, I sell everything. I sell, uh, you go to my website and I sell, you know, merchandise like shirts and mugs and and also art prints or posters. And then I sell digital assets that I've created that are help, you know, to help other people do things, you mm-hmm. know, textures and and now fonts and, and other things. And so I, I'm always reaching for little things just to kind of, you know, because I, I've always been a little bit fearful of only having, you know, like, all your eggs you in know, one all basket. All the eggs in one basket, yeah, right? Yeah, you know, I was absolutely. trying to avoid it, but it was like, like it really is no other <laughs> cliche. <laughs> right. You know, I mean, even it's just a couple of eggs in a couple of baskets. It's just like it always, it's just always kind of like, you know, it's like, oh, I just need to make sure that that you're like, because what happens if that doesn't fall, you know, happen there yeah, or, or absolutely. happen over here? Right. So, so is there one thing that's your, that's a higher percentage of your income or is it truly just really spread all over the place? No, I mean, the the, uh, the website is obviously my biggest source of income, you know, and it's pretty consistent. Well, I wouldn't say that. It's actually not consistent at all. <laughs> it's consistently my biggest income. Okay. Let me put it that way. Okay. Um, it's it's not consistent at all right. right now. But, you know, like it's such a weird, weird time. It was so weird because, you, you know, a lot of people went into 2020 and 2021, you know, like worried about what was going to happen with their income. And my income skyrocketed during 2020. I don't know why. I, I honestly don't know why, but my income skyrocketed and it's dwindled down since. But, um, you know, it it's uh, it's still consistently better than anything else. And then awesome. second from that would be the YouTube. You know, it's not mm-hmm. crazy money, but it's re- it's pretty reliable money that helps yeah. me, you know, earn some income, you know, plus some of the sponsorships here and there. Nice. So we just actually had a podcast all about print on demand, and you've mentioned all these different avenues for print on demand that you've tried. Um, You've done the marketplaces. It looks like you've done the print on demand on your own website using a service, right? Mm -hmm. What do you recommend for those that are first getting started in POD? And what has your experience been on that? So the second part of that question is huge. Um, (laughs) But my, my first recommendation would be for people to just get their feet wet in something whether it's Redbubble um, or, you know, I would start there just to get an idea of how it works. The thing is, is that don't go in with the expectation that you're going to be making lots and lots of money there because it that is a Redbubble, Society6, T Public, any one of those sites where it's like you just add your work. It's free to join, easy to get in. Mm-hmm. But it is a numbers game with that. And it really is about... It, it's figuring out the algorithm. It's figuring out the trends. It's figuring out what your niche is if you want to hit a particular niche and really getting deep in that. And if you want to go there, you can. I know people who are making reasonable income on doing just that, mm-hmm. but it does take a lot of work. However, it's a really good jumping off point to get started in understanding how print on demand mm-hmm. works so that you can at least get a feel for it. And then you, I mean, there's nothing that says that you can't have your designs there. And also have your designs on, say, Etsy, right? And what I've actually talked to this one guy, um, his name is Juno, and he goes by Detour Shorts on uh, YouTube and on uh, Instagram and other places, Detour Shirts. But he 
he's basically said that what he does is designed for Redbubble and mm-hmm. uh, merch by Amazon. Right. And when he finds something that hits, he'll take that and put that on an Etsy page. Right. And then like, because then he knows like it's working because the algorithm is working. Right. The search is working. And so if people are searching Redbubble for that, then they're definitely going to be probably, well, they're not definitely, but they're highly likely, likely going to be searching Etsy for it. Mm-hmm. And so he'll go and integrate his, I don't know what service he uses to integrate into mm-hmm. Etsy, but you can use the top ones are printful.com, printify.com, mm-hmm. yeah. which is the one I'm currently using. Um, I always forget what the other one is. There's Guten. Guten. There you go. There, Yeah, Guten. That's another one. Those are the top three, right? Those are the three that I use for sure. So that's interesting. That's really clever. Yeah. So that's just one. I mean, that's that's the way I would do it. You know, go from Redbubble to either the, the you know, the, the service provider connected with Etsy or the service provider connected to WooCommerce, Shopify, uh, Squarespace, one of those options, which I use Shopify. I printify to Shopify. I yeah. do all the FIs, right? Yeah, and Laura, <laughs> Laura and I use um, WooCommerce and I've got Printify, Printful and Guten all hooked up to my WooCommerce. Nice. Yeah. yeah. I'm super scared about figuring out the shipping. That's the thing that's sort of held me back on getting oh, it's my, horrible. <laughs> my stuff started because WooCommerce and the shipping and then all those uh, platforms. And if you sell your own products as well, how all yeah. of that works and Yeah. There's no elegant solution. No, there is not. Especially <laughs> when you're going, especially if you're going directly to Etsy, because Etsy, you know, they really threw a uh, a wrench in the system when they started asking people or, or rather like demand ask uh, people to, you know, do free shipping on, you know, anything, whatever, 35 bucks or over. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And it, it really, you know, like sometimes uh, like if you use uh the the printful or printify standard shipping sometimes etsy will say hey just let you know this is a more higher than what most people would charge for shipping it's like well i didn't write the thing yeah you- <laughs> we know we know thanks etsy <laughs> right you know so what i've done on my website at least is i just do flat i just do flat reasonable shipping um you know I try not to gouge anybody by country or how I does that work? I've actually set up to three regions. I have United States uh-huh. and then I have I, it's Canada, Mexico, and then everywhere else. Mm-hmm. Okay. Right. <clears throat> the thing is, is I know that everywhere else is probably Australia, um, England, England, you know, UK yeah. and, you know, like maybe a handful of others, yeah. Right? Yeah. you know, somewhere EU, right? I'm not getting a ton of, you know, I've sold to Vietnam once probably in my (laughs) life. Right. Right. And, you know, like if I paid a little extra in shipping for that one, whatever, you know, like it's it's one of those lost leader things like, okay, sometimes you're going to eat it on that. But I just charge a flat, reasonable, you know, as as reasonable as I can get. But I'm also not afraid to kind of look at things like, you know, when you do a print on demand T-shirt. The biggest issue that some people have with T-shirts is that they have a, a an idea of how much a T-shirt should cost, mm-hmm. right? And it's like this yeah. weird thing that T-shirts should only be twenty dollars, which is so bananas to me because when I was a teenager, you know, wanting to go buy shirts at my local surf shop near me, they were twenty dollars. This mm-hmm. was the eighties. Mm-hmm. It's now 40 years later and we're still only looking at t-shirts to cost $20. It just doesn't make wait, any wait, sense. Wait, wait, wait. I have to recover from the fact that the 80s was 40 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> right. It is now, right? right. <laughs> you know. So, you know, like it's it's just one of these things that like the there's this you know, I I believe in the consumer's mind there's this misconception that, you know, this is all the things should cost. Right. And especially you know, when we're talking about buying stuff from artists and designers, small manufacturing, you know, if all you were doing was making t-shirts that say live, laugh, love, well then, okay, I'm not going to spend more than $20 on that because I know that, you know, even though the Mm -hmm. costs are the same, but it's all relative. Right. But that's why, you know, when I design something, it's like, I'm putting every last essence of myself in the work. And it's not one of a kind, but it's still very unique. Yes. Yeah. 
Absolutely. Well, right? and I'll tell you, my nephew is actually really into urban fashion and he play he'll he'll pay like 80 bucks for a T-shirt if it's something yeah. he loves. So there's this weird. Um, What's his like, email gap. address? <laughs> <laughs> Right. But it's a really weird gap, right, between like some brands can just just, you know, have really high. But uh, but on print on demand and stuff and in general, people just think that you should pay fifteen dollars or twenty dollars, like you're saying. Yeah, I think establishing that, you know, and there's no rules that say you had to have established it long before. I think mm-hmm. about this brand that I follow pretty closely, mostly because I follow the the one of the founders of the company called The Hundreds. And they're a streetwear brand. And um they, you know, you can't get a t-shirt there for less than $40. You, mm-hmm. You're, you know, I have a sweatshirt from them and it costs 90 bucks, right. which is crazy. Cause I've never bought a sweatshirt for more than $30. I think in my life, maybe, maybe 40, if I was really, really, really had to have it, but $90. But the thing was, here's the thing. I didn't buy from the hundreds because the sweatshirt was really cool. It is cool, mm-hmm. but I didn't go to the hundreds just to buy a sweatshirt. I went to the mm-hmm. hundreds because Bobby hundreds, the founder of the company is one of these guys that I've just have, uh, you know, a, 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 a social media connection with mm-hmm. somebody yeah. that I really appreciate his view, yeah. his voice, yeah. his, mm-hmm. it, what he shares with the world. I went there. I bought that because of him. There's so right. many other streetwear brands out there that I could have bought from and right. I could have spent a lot of money on, but I bought from him because I like him. And so that's really kind of the point of view that I take on this is like, I don't expect to sell thousands and thousands of shirts. I mm-hmm. just expect to sell a few shirts, few mugs, yard prints or whatever to people that really appreciate who I am. And then are those the primary things that you sell then art prints, mugs, uh, t-shirts on your website right now, at least on the website, plus all the digital assets. Right. Right. And then of course, the NFTs. But as far <laughs> as print on demand, it's, yes. it's mostly. Yeah. Yeah. And it's really the T-shirts, the prints and the mugs are the kind of thing. I, I I almost wanted to push away from the mugs a little bit, but people buy Like, I swear, the mugs are almost like the, the most consistent thing on my shop. More people yeah. buy mugs than they buy shirts. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I mean, they buy art, but the art has a really good margin on it. So, you know, I can sell less art and still make good money on that for sure. Yeah. yeah. And so, you mentioned that you're using Printify right now. Is that correct? That's Printify? correct. Printify? Yeah. yeah, I've been I've been debating between Printful and Printify, but Printify has a lot more products. I think they maybe yeah. they have more suppliers or something. So here's the thing. Here's the thing that my measure with Printful and Printify and, you know, I'm not trying to sway anybody one way or another. You you could do what you want to do. But Printful has a really good connection with the entire industry. Like if you go and look at their their connections to other e-commerce platforms, they mm-hmm. have significantly mm-hmm. more e-commerce plat- platforms than Printify does. Printful is also its own company. Like, so when right. you send the order, they print it. They're the, they're the mm-hmm. ones that do all the printing. Printify is kind of an arbiter. They're a third party that connects okay. to other print shops, mm-hmm. right? And so their their e-commerce solutions are much more limited. The thing about Printful is that they're more expensive. And yeah. when you look at it, you know, a lot of times pound for pound, they're, they could be 20, 30% more than some of these other companies. You know, it just depends on the product. But their their quality might be a little bit more consistent. Uh, you know, it's funny. I have had I had more issues with Printful than I did with Printify. Like I've never had anybody return anything in print while I've been using Printify. Now hmm. maybe they haven't told me, but <laughs> first of all, none of the big ones have a whole lot of issues. They do a really good job, and if there are issues, they take care of it really quickly. Um, but I, I think I've probably had equal issues with all the different companies. But what I find is you kind of have to do a little trial and error with different products. And yeah, like, you know, I like Printify's phone cases better than Printful's, but I like Printful's T-shirts better than Printify. And, you yeah. know, Printify has more unique mug styles with the latte mugs versus the standard mugs that everybody has. So, yeah. So that's why Nikki has three different providers on her website. Yeah, yeah. And that's why if you buy from Nikki's uh, website, your checkout page is going to have like three lines of shipping from different companies. And it's really confusing. (laughs) Yeah, you know, it's it is one of those things. And, you know, the reason I even went to Printify in the first place was that during the middle of the pandemic, Printful got hit like like a Mack truck. 
Mm. because, you know, everybody was gone and their entire company was down, right? They had to shut down the entire company, like a lot of companies did. Yeah. But Printify had a little bit more leverage because they were working with different they were providers. They so spread out. Right. And so they had a little bit more leverage there. And there was a period there where Printful's um, production time was like 30 business days for a T-shirt. Business wow. days. Wow. Right? Yeah. You know, yeah. so like you're looking at like seven weeks to get a T-shirt or something like that. When it's just normally, cr- under normal circumstances, they all turn them around really quickly. Yeah, really quickly. Yeah. Really quickly. Like I remember one time putting in an order with, I don't remember who it was. It was one of the two. It was a pr- print full, print five. But they a, a T-shirt order came in before, like within six hours, it had been processed and and packaged or at least ready to go out the door yeah. before yeah. the even the end of the day. It didn't, you know, like the mail that probably already come. So they couldn't do anything about it. But like it was already ready to go within the same day. And that's that's happened a few times. It was just like, God, that's just amazing right. that they're that they're that on it. Right. Right. So, you know, I I wouldn't disparage anybody from checking out all three, you know, and, um, you know, they all do really good work. It's just a matter of like, you know, where you want to, you know, put time and energy and, yeah. you know, focus. If you're first getting into print on demand, pick one. Don't yep. do all three. Yeah, pick don't get one. overwhelmed. Uh, just yeah. just pick one that look that feels That's good. That's what to I'm you. gonna do. I'm gonna yeah. pick one. Yeah. I actually had picked Printful, but now I'm. You might be convincing me to use Printify no, instead. Just, now, <laughs> just just do Printful. Just do Printful, right? And then if you, as you start to get more comfortable with it, mm-hmm. then go look at the other ones. Right? Yeah, that's just good advice. It, because you yeah. will get, you'll get. You, you you just get that analysis paralysis, right? Oh, well, maybe, it, well, they do this different than this over here. Well, Laura does have a this. special skill in overthinking. I do. <laughs> I do. No, but I would just it, do printful and then yeah. let it ride. But here's the thing. When people are just getting started, it can be really intimidating if you had just started your own website, right? Like, and then now you're trying to create an e-commerce shop and connect all of that with Printful or Printify. So I think that's why some people choose something like Society6 first, Mm -hmm. because they don't have to worry about the tech side of things. Yeah. Um, The thing about that is that what, and this is a lesson I've learned a long time ago, is that it's it's viable. That's absolutely viable, even just to do it to Etsy, right? still viable because you have a connection to Etsy's algorithm for search and all that stuff that mm -hmm. you will not get on your own website, right? But at the end of the day, those customers, they belong to the platform. Yep. Yep. Yeah. They're not your customers. Right. I mean, you, you, you don't have any recourse for being able to reach out to them directly. Yeah. I mean, yeah, sure. You can send a message to somebody on Etsy, but what's the chances of being able to, you know, like say, Hey, I got a, you know, you're not going to do one message at a time to every person that's ever bought from you saying, Hey, I've got a sale coming on or something like that. But if you bring them into your website, you you know, pull their email address or, you know, ask them gently for their email right, address, right. And, you know, and then you have that ability, you know. So um, many years ago on my podcast years ago, I, I spoke with a woman who was on Etsy and then also at her own website. And this is actually what sent me on the path of me doing my own thing for the website wise. And she she had told me, I said, why do you have both? And she said, well, you know, I'm trying to move more people over to my website. Because she was mm-hmm. getting more of a name for herself, and mm-hmm. um, she she made like these really nice wool uh, device sleeves. So I found her because I bought like a, I had a Kindle and I wanted a sleeve to put my Kindle yeah. in. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. And you know, I just kind of went you know found her that way. But she made these really nice ones, and she was finding a name for herself. Like she was had connections, or she had made a collaboration with Room and Board, and she was getting mm-hmm. found on all these different. Um, you know, bloggers, websites, and also uh, some different magazines that relate to accessories and, you mm-hmm. know, fashion right. and all that stuff. But anyway, so I said, why? So why not just kill off the Etsy or why not just like stop using the Etsy? And she said, because the Etsy algorithm is just too strong. It's just too powerful. I'm getting attention from these other places because of Etsy. They're not finding me because of my website. Hmm. They're finding me because of Etsy and then going over there. So let's let's talk about that. Let's talk about how you get how you get found, how you market your own print on demand <laughs> stuff and how you how you get found on your own platform. Do you have any any insight for us? Any Oh man. You know, it it's just I was a big subscriber for for a long time to the whole Gary V mentality of be everywhere, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. For many many years I'd done that, you know, like I was on 
every single platform out there. That and sounds exhausting. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's super easy for Gary Vee to do it because he's got, you know, a team of 18 people right. helping him put everything. Right. All he has to right. do is sit there and be a loud mouth on the camera and then they'll go and sparse and it And he does up. it so well. <laughs> yeah, he does it so well. Right. So, you know, um, it's just, I think at, at a certain point, again, this is self-awareness also, you know, but it's like realizing where your people are at, you know, and, mm -hmm. but then also having respect for your own energy, right? Your own, you know, uh, what, what, what suits you and what makes you feel good because I was actually starting to, in fact, um, Nikki, I don't remember if you found, did you find me on TikTok first or on Instagram first? I can't Instagram. Remember. Okay. Yeah. So I'm on TikTok. I barely ever look at TikTok. <laughs> yeah. Me, I'm the same now, actually. Yeah. But I was doing really well during the middle of the pandemic, or it was actually before the pandemic, but middle of the pandemic, I kind of blew up a little bit. Yeah. There. A little bit. Not not crazy, but mm -hmm. I really kind of had hit a I hit a, a surge and I was enjoying it for a while. But I, then I was noticing that I wasn't making as much stuff. I was like spending more time scrolling through other people's TikToks and, you know, and doing stupid videos and not really focusing my energy. And then it, it just like for a while there was just like, God, this is just not suiting me. It's not doing me well. It's like, I don't feel as good about this. And so yeah. I kind of pulled away from that. I think you have to be 18 to feel really good about TikTok. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I know some people that are, that are blown up on there, but I think that they also like, you know, you get wrapped up in the weird kind of sociopolitics of things in there sometimes. And it's just like, oh, this is just not fun. But yeah. that said, and, and how much reason, of that traffic really converts, you know, into a paid customer? Actually, so what really worked for me on TikTok wasn't necessarily the the videos that I would do, but it would when it was when I would go live on on TikTok, mm, and okay. that built up quite a bit of following there for a while. That like people would come in and you know participate, and we would have a good time. And I mean, going live is fun with when, when you've got a bunch of friends hanging around, and you know it, it wasn't meant to be like, hey, buy my stuff, but it was just like you you talk about things and you get commiseration with people and they feel good about things and they want to go do their own thing. And they turn around and go, just like I said, they might not necessarily have their own side hustle, but you know, they listen to me long enough and they get, you know, get juice from me and then they turn around and go buy a do the work mug. You know, yeah. I don't have yeah. that sweatshirt on me right now. But um, you know, they'll go buy a mug, right? To, after they after they heard me talk for a while. And so I actually did pretty well because of that during the pandemic. And that was good for a while, but then TikTok changed the algorithm and I wasn't getting nearly as many people in my lives as I, as I was before. Wasn't get as much discovery as the story usually goes. So uh, not as much vibe there. And so I was like, well, my energy isn't as well spent here anymore. So, you know, I, I turned to YouTube, which was a lot more easier because I wasn't, I, you know, it was more like, I felt like I could control my energy as I'm sitting here trying to express myself in different ways. And, you know, I'd always been on YouTube, but I really turned my energy around and started focusing on there a lot more. And that between that and Instagram, which I have a love hate relationship with because I don't, I don't, I don't particularly uh, appreciate the company, but I understand right. that Instagram is one of these, you know, like, um, you know, must have evil things yeah. in your life, or right? Necessary evil. <laughs> right, exactly. There you go. Thank you. You do a lot of Instagram stories. Yeah. And then I was just showing Laura um, the other day all of all of the things that you talk about on on YouTube. You have lots of great instructional things about Shopify, Etsy, uh, Affinity, all kinds of things. So, yeah. I mean, I'm guessing. All of those things drive traffic to your website. Yeah, to a certain degree. Yeah. You know, and especially if it's like, you know, I, especially with the, w with the design oriented tutorials, like when I'm talking about mm -hmm. affinity and people yeah. really appreciate that, but then I turn around and say, Hey, I've, I've built this thing, this, a uh, digital asset that you can mm -hmm. use in affinity or a Photoshop or whatever. You right. can use this thing and here's how you use it. And here's, you know, here's what I do with it. And I only build stuff that I would actually use myself. Like mm -hmm. I, there's a lot of places out there that will build a bunch of stuff. And it's just like, you know, it's like, but do you actually design like that? Is that something you would actually put on your own work? Right. And mm -hmm. I, like, I just, you know, I, I, so many times I, I've told myself like, oh, maybe I should do a thing like this because I saw somebody else do it. And then I like shake my head at myself because I was like, no, I'm not going to do that. But yes. So YouTube drives traffic. 
Instagram will drive traffic and, uh, you know, uh, to the website or whatever. And I think it's really, again, it just comes down to the more I show up in a way that is meant to help somebody do something, then, you know, the, I'm always going to get somebody coming around. And if they don't buy a digital asset, then they buy an art print or they buy a poster. Right. right? Yeah. Yeah. We actually interviewed Lisa Glanz a while back on digital product creation. She does a lot of uh, Procreate brushes and things like that. Yeah, I'm very fa- I'm familiar with her. Yeah, character development things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and I, I probably own all of them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I. I, I There's found no out probably through, about it. Right, no probably about it. Yeah, I uh, I I know about her because of the Honest Designers show that she is on with with right with Tom. Yeah, and it was actually through them that I applied to Design Cuts. Right, I applied Design Cuts, and I have some of my graphic assets on there because oh, awesome. of that podcast. Right. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. So yeah. you said you sell textures and what other, what, what kind of digital assets you said textures and fonts? I have one font available now. I'm actually building a handwritten typeface right now. Um, because, well, I'm doing it for this course that I've got that it's not out yet, but it's coming, but I'm building like, I'm and I don't, is this, is this video going live or is it just audio? I don't even know. It's just audio. Okay. We can show an image of it though. <laughs> okay. I'll take a picture, but there's a, uh, you know, pretend I'm holding up a sheet of paper with a bunch of handwritten scribbles on it. So that's uh, <laughs> I described a screenshot of it. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> so um, I I'm doing that. You know, so I'm building fonts for that, and I'm building. You know, I built the other font just because I'm like, hey, I wonder what would happen if I took Helvetica, which is definitely absolutely my favorite typeface in the world if i took helvetica Mm -hmm. and just you know i just turned it on its head i just tried to screw with it and make it you know my own right Uh Mm -hmm. and so i I made that for that reason and i wanted to experiment with it and that actually what's that's the reason why i started the whole course in the first place is because of that because i was like oh i learned how to do this so i'm going to share it with everybody else but yeah but um so i have textures and Mm -hmm. I, i like gritty stuff yeah um the textures that I bring in are things that I've actually experienced in my own, you know, area. Like I, like I did a whole one that's just, it's called uh, stain, and it's all just distressed concrete from my entire city. Like I walk around my city and I just take pictures of like whether it's stained by paint or oil or weathered by rain or whatever, and I just took yeah. a bunch of pictures of that and just you know converted them so that they would turn into something nice to you know to use as textures i i created a whole like i go around and take pictures of like all kinds of distressed type like stickers that are torn apart or signage that just kind of got uh, yeah and you and, show a lot of that in your um on your instagram too i really enjoy that yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. yeah. so i just pull all these assets as i see and i was just like i have all these things why aren't i not putting them together for yeah. other people to yeah. enjoy or to yeah. use yeah great yeah so and then i've experimented with some like what do you call it? Like add-ons to the, to like, I only do it in affinity, but where you can drop in like, uh, like a color overlay yeah, or a mm-hmm. blendy, not what am I thinking? I am like a gradient mm-hmm. overlay. So, that, you know, you can add some gradient overlays cool. to your pieces and whatnot, things like that. So, well, we'll definitely link to your website as well as your design cuts assets because we're big design cuts fans over here. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I need to I need to update so badly, but yeah. <laughs> I, I want to switch gears a bit because we um we we could talk to you for hours, but we're coming up on an hour already. Okay. And we really <laughs> want to talk about about art and design challenges. And okay. I participated in the September challenge that you started just last fall mm-hmm. for um print on demand and where you had you did it yourself and you had other artists create a t-shirt design a day to sell on whatever print on demand platform they were comfortable with. Mm -hmm. Um, And I loved it. I loved it. I really did. And um, you had a good time with it. Yeah. You came up with some really cool designs, Nikki. Thanks. Thanks. And you know, I didn't have a ton of time and I thought it was a great challenge to participate in because what I could do is I could take drawings that I had already created, but turn them into t-shirt designs and not just slap a design on a t-shirt. I had a lot of fun with creating like an all over t-shirt design. Um, anyway, but we want to talk about what it was like to create the challenge, to promote it. And you even participated in your own challenge. Mm-hmm. Um, where'd the idea come from? How did that go for you? You know, it's, it's funny. I was like trying to remember exactly where the name I, I was already doing a poster day challenge. I remember 
It, but that was mostly you kind of set that up for yourself, right? Yeah, it's just for myself, just like a daily challenge, uh-huh. do a daily poster day for daily challenge, mm-hmm. just to because you know why not, right? To stretch mm-hmm. the legs every day in a certain way, and I don't remember exactly what the what was the cause of me thinking about it. It probably just as you know, like shower thoughts, right? In the middle of a shower, right? Inktober. <laughs> well, it wasn't, you know, like I knew I wasn't going to do Inktober this year or this past year because I'd done it years in the past. Mm-hmm. And um, I was just like, I'm not going to do it. But I, I knew that if I was going to do a challenge, I wanted it to be like, if I was going to encourage people to do a challenge, I wanted it to be more than just, Hey, let's draw things. Right. Right. Yeah. Let's draw things so that we can make things so that maybe we can put a little coin in our pocket. Yeah. I mean, I really wanted it to be more enterprising than just the idea of making stuff because everybody does make stuff challenges, which is right. cool. If you want to do a hundred day challenge, Inktober, whatever November is, I feel there's another name for November. Like you could do these every day, every yeah. year. Right. <laughs> well, I mean, the drawing ones are a great place to start. Yeah. But then it's like taking it to the next level, right? Yes. Yeah. And I think it's just, th- it helps people start thinking about just building something beyond the scope of just whatever art that they were doing before. Because that was mm-hmm. part of the parameters was that you just, it wasn't just about drawing something and mocking it up on a shirt. It was about mm-hmm. getting it up onto a platform, mm-hmm. whether it's Redbubble or Etsy or your Mm -hmm. own website or whatever. It was just, let's get something moving and -hmm. hopefully build momentum because there's something to be said about momentum in these things. You know, sometimes you get to the end of 30 days and you're just like, I don't want to do another shirt for the rest of my life. (laughs) But, 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 you know, like the idea is just to build the momentum and, you know, just to, and also kind of, I don't just get acquainted with the idea of doing this and how Mm -hmm. easy it really could be if you just spent a little bit of time. And should you do it every day after the fact? Probably not. You know, like I don't design shirts every single day. I do them when I feel the, the real urge to make something cool. You know. Well, so let's talk about how it was received. Um, I, it seemed like a lot of people were participating and you were sharing a lot of people's stuff. You shared mine quite a bit, yeah. and I really appreciated that. It was called Shirt Timber, is that right? Shirt Timber, yeah. Okay. Every day in September. Yeah. Um, so did you have any expectations for how many people were would participate, how many things you would sell, and, you know? No, not really. I mean, I knew I wanted to do it. It really was initially just something, I'm going to design a shirt every day in September, and I was going to call it Shirt Timber. And I, I was just going to do that, but I thought, you know what, I'm, I'm going to get other people to do it because I don't mm-hmm. like, and I think the, that's what I was getting at is that with the posters, I was just, I was doing it for myself just right. to see if I could do posters every day. But I said, instead, I'm going to do sh- shirts so that I could mm-hmm. have, you know, a bunch of shirts up on my website because I was like, I need new stuff. I need more stuff to fill my website, mm-hmm. you know, something fresh. But I thought, well, why not just let other people participate? And I, yeah. so I didn't really have any ideas of how many people would participate Mm -hmm. it's really sometimes hard to tell where my base kind of because of all the different things that i do it's a little bit hard to tell sometimes like how active my base is going to be interested in this you know these little dalliances that i have with these things right Right. Mm -hmm. so i didn't have any expectations but i was pleasantly surprised that we were building up a little bit of a community there for a bit and everybody was like interacting with each other and and Mm -hmm. a lot of people followed each other and everything like that and so i thought that was pretty cool yeah i definitely got some new followers from it and followed some new people yeah and i think that it also was it's just good to have some sort of number one have camaraderie from other people that you know Mm -hmm. as you were you know like kind of like the the encouragement of other people to help you kind of keep through and keep pushing through to the end Mm -hmm. or just being able to see what other people can create to kind of spur other ideas within you to make cool stuff right yeah so do you feel like it grew your social media following at all to a certain degree it didn't go it wasn't crazy i if i had to say that there were you know, I mean, it's the first year doing it and I really like it was like last minute yeah. kind of you know yeah. idea to do something. Uh, you know, I think I gained maybe, you know, maybe 100 followers on Instagram because of, eh. I mean, I had I have at least that on the shirt timber account on right. Instagram by itself. Right. But, you know, I think from that, you know, a derivative, I, you know, those people followed me over. 
Cool. To Instagram, you know, so. Are you going to do it again next year? I mean, that's the plan, you know, I mean, it, I'm trying yeah, to. Yeah, I'd love to see it grow into a, you know, a regular thing that just gets more and more of an audience and participation. I'll do it again. Yeah. You know, and I think it's something interesting for people that because, you know, like if they're so interested in doing something like Inktober, mm-hmm. which has gotten, you know, hugely popular. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like take this same idea, but make it even better for yourself than just let's draw. Yeah. Things, right. You know, well, maybe next year should be Mugtober. <laughs> or mug timber <laughs> well you know and here's the thing i actually you know i call it shirt timber but i told people that it doesn't necessarily have to be a shirt if you wanted it to be mugs be mugs yeah right but it should be the goal isn't so much about what substrate you're using but rather mm-hmm. the idea of getting the thing up onto a shop so yeah. that you can turn around and tell people about it later yeah Mm-hmm. You know, that was really the goal. I mean, it could be, you know, duvet covers. I don't care. Do whatever you want. <laughs> but there's no alliteration there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a, duvet cover ember. No. Duvet. Duvet. No. Duve, no. <laughs> Can't do it. Can't do it. No. Well, no. and POD no. makes it easy. These platforms, you're literally uploading your artwork. You might have to have a certain dimension. And, and if it's a physical thing, you have to scan it in and do that stuff. But in essence, it's become so accessible for people to do this, but we feel like it's hard. And so we don't. Um, So I think what you're saying is having that momentum and going in there and doing it really um, is awesome. So I actually have two questions for you that I'm super curious about. Mm -hmm. Since you are an incredible experimenter, can you share with us one thing that you tried out that did incredibly well for you? And one thing that you tested out that completely bombed? (laughs) <laughs> oh my gosh i uh, do i have to pick one on that last one because there's like so many <laughs> so many okay so one thing that did incredibly well uh was well i i the number one thing that i sell is my do the work mug well it's mm-hmm. actually i mean I, I would say do the work anything we'll link to it yeah link to it it's it was so simple you know it, it was a phrase that i was using Anyway, mm-hmm, and somebody mm-hmm. just said, like, that would be so cool on a mug. So, uh, you know, I, I painted it with actual ink on paper. Mm-hmm. I got, man, I uh, talk about, uh, you know, versions of, it, like just I, I killed so many pieces of, of white printer paper just doing this, <laughs> like just killing off a whole ream of paper. Just get this just so right. I just mm-hmm. and it's so weird because it's like a Sumi brush oriented design. And I and I felt like I was like getting full on art director on this thing. Like, no, the O has to be just <laughs> this way. And I was like tweaking this design for so long, you know, until, you know, I started doing it. And then I, I put it on a mug. I put it on a print. I put it on a shirt and a, and a, and a sweatshirt. It is the thing that I get consistently uh, that consistently sells. And it's also the thing that gets consistently shared. Yeah. Like, it is the one thing that I get like mugs shared all the time. Like somebody will tag me in a post, right. you know, I love that phrase. Um, yeah. I think Stephen Pressfield has a book called that. Is Does it he? Stephen, Stephen Pressfield? I'll have to look that up. Maybe. Yeah. <laughs> yeah I don't, I, I just, it's, it's just, it's something, well, it's tr- transcended into my family life. It's something I share with my son all the time. I was like, listen, man, you know, you got to do the work, right? All the time I'm telling him that, you know, like, if you want to be successful at this, you got to do the work, right? It's something that transcends. And so I, I believe that it resonates with people on multi levels. They don't have to be an artist, a designer. It could be. Oh, yeah, anything. that could go for anything. Right. Yeah. It is. Steven does have a book called Do the Work. Oh, does he? Nice. Yeah. Well, he took it from me. Yeah, I'm just saying. He did. <laughs> <laughs> I want my royalty, Stephen. <laughs> um, no, but as far as bombs, man. Um, okay, so this was quite a few years ago, and it's, and it's actually part of the reason why it's taken me so many years to get back to creating my own course, is that back in probably 20... 13, 14, yeah, maybe it was 2014. I created my first course ever. And it was all about magazine design. And it was like how to build your own zine or magazine. Mm-hmm. Because I know that there's a lot of designers who probably have never, they, you know, they may have an understanding of how to build something like mm-hmm. that. But 
you know, they didn't have the direct connection to it, like how to process like all the different, you know, all getting all the gears in the right place, you know, everything mm-hmm. working together so you can put something out that's, you know, nice instead of like, you know, that, you know, something that actually, people actually want to read and, and enjoy. And so I put out this course and I, you know, I test the idea with people and like so many people had just said, oh yeah, that sounds great. I would love to learn how to do that. And I built the whole course. I built the entire course and it fell completely flat. I didn't mm-hmm. get, no, I got two sales. Oh, wow. On it, wow. Which I was like, well, this is just not even worth it. Right. Because it was like, part of it was like going to be the live interaction with things. Yeah. So I ended up like. I was going to refund both. And I, I did that to one person and the other person said, well, why don't you, why don't we just, why don't we just turn it into consultation instead? And so I ended up becoming right. like a design and consult instead for that person. I was just like, oh, you know, and then I thought about digging it out and trying to see if I could repurpose it, you know, these days, but I was like, I'm just, I don't know if it's going to, it, it wouldn't go anywhere. Plus the, the, you know, the information has changed and I was yeah. so much more awkward on the camera than I am now. <laughs> Well, so, what would you have done differently that you think would have made it succeed knowing what you know now? I think I would have done a lot more market testing, you know, really yeah. kind of understand a little bit more because there's probably something there within the idea of, you know, wanting to teach people how to build something. Well, I'll give you a perfect example because this is actually very real time information for me right now. I had this idea of creating a course about Shopify. Mm-hmm. Like how to really kind of for Shopify for creatives, right? Right. Yeah. Because in the process of two weeks, a couple months ago, I, or maybe it was, I don't know, maybe last month, November or something like that. In the process of two weeks, I had four different friends all reach out to me about knowledge on the topic of Shopify. Mm. And I was like, well, geez, maybe there's something here. There's definitely something there. Mm-hmm. There's something right? here. So I thought about that and I started to kind of formulate the idea. And then as I started to, you know, drip the information out to people via, you know, social media mm-hmm. and on YouTube or whatever, like it was just falling 100% flat. Like really? it just was mm-hmm. going nowhere. Huh. And I was like, okay, so there's obviously something about the way I'm approaching it. Like maybe it's the way I'm sharing it, the what I'm talking about that isn't getting people inspired and or, or at least, you know, I, I'm not triggering the the need. I'm not triggering that that, um, you know, I'm not answering the question that they need answered right there. Right. So I, I so I tabled that idea for a little bit. And uh, and then instead I said, well, OK, so ultimately what's my goal with that course like what do i want you know it's going to be a big ticket item at some point what would be my goal or rather what would be the end result of that course what do i really want these people to walk away from it Mm -hmm. and it's like and it kind of goes back to the whole thing about shop or the shirt timber right being able to walk away with something where you have a functional website that's working that you know has print on demand integrated and it's just something that you can just like that you you're just ready to go and you know you're no longer struggling. You're no longer crippled by the technology or, you know, or whatever, you know, sense that might be keeping you from doing it now. Mm-hmm. So if that's what I want to achieve, how do I get people more ramped up to that idea? And so I just said to myself, like, okay, well, I think what I need to do is kind of baby step people into that idea. So right. I'm creating actually courses right now that are very they're design oriented courses that are driven towards the idea of building something for themselves. So this course about turning your own handwritten type into mm-hmm. a font is so that, okay, now you have something that you can use, but you can sell it. Right. The next course I'm going to create is like a uh, poster design, you know, like, okay, so it's called poster maker. Right. Mm-hmm. And so it's like, okay, so creating poster prints, right. And using print on demand to, you know, integrate that, but talking about very clearly about what works about poster design, why does certain posters work and certain posters are crap and whatever, you know, things like that. And then I want to do another one about t-shirts and call it, it's called Mm -hmm. a shirt machine. Cool. And it's all about my ideologies on t-shirts and what Uh I think about t-shirts and, and then also integrating the idea of like how to integrate, how to get it ready to go into print on demand. And so it's all these different things, like these little baby steps towards building something. So then, okay, now, now I've taught you all these things. What are you going to do with it? 
right? Mm -hmm. Oh, you don't know how to use Shopify? Guess what? I got it in the course. <laughs> ah, yeah, I see. Clever. Yeah. You know, and not to try and noodle people into it to, to buy into all these different things. You know, like I'm not trying to be one of those, you know, constant uh what do you call it? the it's like you know the next upsell right that's right. not really what this is about no it's but really one just naturally leads into the other in terms of what people are going to want to know yeah yeah it's a it's a i can't say that word it's a sequential learning process yes mm -hmm. exactly yeah that's great i'm glad you said it and i didn't but uh because <laughs> i would have fumbled that too words are hard <laughs> words are, uh, you know and it's you know it's, maybe people don't want posters but they do want t-shirts or, right. you know, mm -hmm. or what work, you know, like I, I don't plan on doing one for mugs, but, but you know, like I do plan on doing one and I, 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 the cheeky name that I have for it now is assets and profits, right? Mm -hmm. Because it's like graphic assets, building mm -hmm. your own graphic assets and then making profits from that. Awesome. So, um, you know, so it's like tapping into all the things that I do know that I know yeah. that people may want to do for themselves and bringing an opportunity for them to, you know, hopefully turn some of that into cash. Awesome. So as sad as this is, we're going to have to start wrapping things up so that we don't talk for like six hours, <laughs> which I'd love to do. <laughs> well, they would continue another time for sure. Uh, yeah. But um, so we have just kind of a couple questions that we like to throw at everybody at the end. And one of them is, What's one piece of advice that you can give to artists, illustrators, designers who are just getting started? Oh my gosh. Um, that's always such a, you know, it's a, it's a big one because it's so the best advice that I think I ever got mm -hmm. was that the way you've internalized your fear is way bigger than it actually it, it is. Right. What you imagine your fear to be yes. is way bigger then, mm -hmm. you know, whatever that what's actually real. Right. Yeah. Reality is never as bad as the as the anticipation of it. Right. But fear is weak. I mean, it's so weak. It's soft. It may look big and scary, but it mm -hmm. is so weak because this first time you ever push against it, it falls away every single time. I mean, unless you're like, you know, like got this deathly fear of snakes and you got thrown into a <laughs> snake pit. Right. I mean, I, I, yeah. I'm not, I'm not going into full on psychosis we're, here. We're but, not talking about serious phobias. Right, we're talking right. about everyday fears. Right. Yeah, Dave, right. I'm, I'm not going to be swimming with sharks anytime soon. Right. Just, just, so you know, <laughs> <laughs> right. You don't know what print on demand service to use. So you don't try any, well, there's a, there's a fear there. There's mm -hmm, a fear. Mm -hmm. There's a, a fear of picking the wrong one. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Like, well, there is no wrong one. It's right. just the anyone one you choose, is, right? Anyone is better than not picking one. Right, right. You know, and so it, stepping into the, whatever that fear is, right? Pushing back against that fear, stepping into it is, it's really the biggest thing. Because uh, I think part of the reason that I am so willing to try all these new things is because I've recognized that I don't have to be scared of these things. And mm -hmm. I never know what's going to be the real thing until I jump in. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. With the yeah. sharks. With the with sharks. With the sharks. <laughs> with, <laughs> right. No, it, you know, so, you know, and then that in combination with the idea of that, you know, your comfort circle, every time you take one step outside of that comfort circle, it's not like the circle follows you, but stays the same diameter. It expands. Yeah. Every single tiny baby step that you take outside your circle expands your circle. And so, you know, the more that you move outside of there, the more comfortable you're going to get with stuff, you know, and you may not want to do live video on I Instagram or, or TikTok. You may not want to mm -hmm. do dances. Are you looking at us when you say that? <laughs> right. no, I'm looking at the camera thinking that there's other people behind there actually watching me. Right. No, it, it's us. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and it, um, you may not want to get up on YouTube and film yourself. You may not want to record a podcast. You may not want to jump into Redbubble because it just looks so intimidating. You may not want to even consider the idea of doing NFTs because what the hell is cryptocurrency? I don't even know. what, it, mm -hmm. what It's just a JPEG. No, there's so much more to it. But you won't know until you take that first step into something. And you'll find out real quickly that it wasn't anywhere as scary 
as you expected it to be. For sure. It's taking action makes yeah. that fear go away. Yeah. 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 Got to be brave. Well, Dave, where can our listeners find you online? Everywhere. Everywhere, yeah. <laughs> I'll give you the laundry list of all my links to all my social media. At, at Dave Connery is, you know, largely where you'll find me. You know, okay. at, at Twitter, uh, Instagram, YouTube, at Dave Connery. Or you go to my website, DaveConnery.com. And uh, if you search Dave Connery on the internet, it'll tell you on Google, it will tell you everything you need to know about me. They're little, my, <laughs> my son did this not to really, dad, I looked at your name at Google and you came up everywhere. I was like, yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah. Your son is adorable, by <laughs> yeah, the way. Right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. I'm not looking forward to him being 16 years old, trying to sneak girls into the, into the bedroom when I'm not looking. <laughs> And that's a different podcast. Right. Yeah. Like, oh, God, you don't even know. I mean, I'm not going to share a picture with him on the web on this podcast episode. But ladies, I'm just telling you, like, he's he's a handsome devil. Oh, he's a cutie. Yeah. <laughs> he gets it from his mom. <laughs> Dave, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us today. We've so enjoyed this conversation. I know our listeners are going to get a crazy amount of value out of it. Um, with your story and, and all the educational content you've created for designers and artists. We'll be sure to link to all of your links in the show notes. And uh, we just thank you for being here. Oh, thanks for having me. It was a fun conversation. I really enjoyed it. To learn more about Dave and read today's Stardust Society show notes, go to stardustsociety.com slash Dave Connery. If you've enjoyed today's episode, we'd love for you to leave us a five-star rating and review. Reviews help us reach more stardusts like you and keep us inspired to create new episodes. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next week 